Good morning. Come on in. Good to see each and every one of you. I pray that we are looking for a real revival, not just this morning, but each and every time that we come in God's house, we're expecting a blessing and we want to be a blessing. So I hope that's the reason that you're here this morning. Happy to uh, be celebrating Homecoming Sunday with you today, 134 years, 134 years. Let's give our church a hand. I want to read to you quickly a little bit of the church history, and uh, some of you may know what we're going to say here, and others you hadn't heard it in a long time, so let's cover it real quickly. The first services were held in a brush arbor. Reverend Tom S. Wright named the church New Home. The nine members had services in a nearby schoolhouse until they could build a church. A presbytery composed of Brother T.S. Wright and J.M. Hartzell on Sunday, August 5th, 1889, organized New Home Baptist Church in Anson County of North Carolina. The church lot of one and one and a half acres was purchased from Mr. Joseph Thomas, October 7th, in 1890 for a cost of $15. Sunday school was organized in 1894, and everyone was in the same class until they later used curtains to, to divide the classrooms. Cemetery lot was purchased from Mr. Samuel and Miss Hattie Mitchum on March 5th, 1904 for the cost of $5. Reverend T.S. Wright served as pastor of the body of nine members for one year. Reverend J.W. Little succeeded Reverend Wright and received a salary of $25 per year. In 1924, wings were added onto the one room that they already had built. Preaching services were held every first uh, Saturday and Sunday of each month. On Saturday, they had their business meetings, and Sunday was held for worship. And I want to stop there for just a moment. I did a little bit of research on that. So they traveled here on Saturdays to be together, to eat and break bread together, have a business meeting, and then most of the time, they slept here overnight in the church building and tents around, uh, looking forward to the service for the next day. In 1940, the church building was brick veneered and the walls were sheetrocked. New windows were installed, new pews were bought, new furniture for the pulpit. A new piano was bought and hardwood floors were installed. In 49, a heating system was installed in the church. And in 1952, the church started having uh, worship services every first and third Sunday morning. Sunday school was held every Sunday and choir practice every Sunday night. I thought you might like that, Tim. The WMU was organized in 1953 with 10 members and Vacation Bible School was started in 1955. Construction of the educational building was started on April 5th of 1960 by Rami Thomas and completed August 1st of that same year. The total cost was $14,000. The debt was paid off the next August, and as the years have passed, the church has undergone several remodeling projects. In August of 1989, we had a centennial celebration to celebrate 100 years. The late Reverend C.H. Airwood served our church as interim pastor on two occasions. In December of 91, held the uh, groundbreaking for the multi-purpose building which was finished in 92 at a cost of $105,000, which was one half the cost of the contractor's original price. Reverend Ned Christie and members and friends donated a lot of time, labor, and equipment, which helped to save the church money. In 2005, there was a groundbreaking for a new sanctuary, and we were able to worship in the new building in April of 2006, Reverend George Center helped with overseeing the building of the sanctuary. And on April 23rd of 2006, a dedication service was held to dedicate our new building. And in June, the church was incorporated at New Home Baptist Church of Anson County. In December 2011, a plaque was placed in the vestibule in honor of our former pastor, Reverend Ned Christie. Very great history. I have another article, I won't read it, but it was, undoubtedly was in the newspaper back in the 70s, and it listed all the pastors that had come here. It listed uh, some of the things that the church was doing, how involved it was in mission work, 
how it was helping out in the community. And the title of that message, or the title of the article was New Home Church is a Beacon in, of rural, in Rural Life of West Anson County. And I pray that we still are a beacon. I pray that we still uh, are a lighthouse uh, in the midst of darkness and continuing to feel the presence of God in our midst. And not only receiving His presence and feeling His Spirit, but I pray that we will share that with others all around. All right. Let's raise our hands to our Lord as we pray. Father God, we love you for who you are. We thank you for our rich heritage of 134 years. In the silence of this moment, we give reverence to all those lives that you have touched, those that have long since passed, all the duties that they had here at this church so that we could enjoy being here this morning. Lord, it is a great homecoming, but not as great as the homecoming that we will all experience one day as we cross over and come to our heavenly homes. Lord, but let that not be the only reason that we come to church and know you as Savior. No, you have challenged us to be a light, not just as a congregation, but as individuals, to get out in our community and show others your love. Lord, help us to be about your will. Help us to be busy and help us to find ourselves in revival this week, knowing hearts and lives can be changed with the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that that's why we are considered as Christians, that we would be like him, serve like him, and make sure that every person knows that Jesus died for them. Lord, we give our service unto you this morning, and we ask that you and you alone would work mightily. I've been so looking forward to this time, and I pray that you would bless it mightily this morning, that we would forget about anything that's troubling us. We will set it down, and we will find ourselves in a spirit of worship, worshiping you and you alone. Touch us as only you can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. While you're getting back to your seats, if you have your Bibles with you, you can join me in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking in the uh, wonderful book of Numbers 12 and 13, and then we'll close in Deuteronomy chapter 10. As I was trying to get together uh, a message the last few weeks, just trying to, to focus on what God would have us to talk about and cover and you know, I try to be really, really patient in that and let God show me some things through my own life or through circumstances that are going on. And um, I began to think about uh, the financial commitment that the church does each year for revival. And I, I want you to know this, so let, let me just spell it out for you. Our, our, our deacons uh, have been very, very gracious to allow us to to spend some funds, to get some speakers in here, to advertise, to get the word out there. And, you know, we've got the banners out here in three different places. We've got uh, a good expense in the mailings that went out. I hope most of you got those, and I hope that your neighbors got them. Um, it costs to put these guys up for a few nights in the hotels and for their travel. Uh, but more so than that, there's a cost that you have put into it Inviting people, asking folks to come, families, relatives, neighbors, folks in your community. Uh, many have visited several days in our community and reached out to folks, and we did a little bit of that yesterday. But let me just tell you, there's a negative connotation in our world now about anything dealing with Christ. Uh, they tell us that the Word is... It's old-fashioned, that it's not accurate in our day, um, but we're going to be reading from, from, from numbers, something that occurred some 3,300 years ago, and it's as accurate today as it was then, and we will see that, and we will be able to feel it. But that negative connotation would tell us that there may not be a need for revival, there may not be a need for a big hoopla of a homecoming or inviting people that haven't come in a while or, 
or even getting the gospel message out there. But let me tell you, there are still people that need to know Christ as Savior. And I pray that maybe you're here today because you need to know Him. But let's not get hung up on the numbers. Let's not worry about the church house being full. That'd be great. It's a good crowd this morning. But let's think about a number of one. If there's one person whose life is saved for all eternity, then all our efforts, all our financial commitment, all the time, all the prayer, all that put into it, it'll certainly be worth it. I hope you feel the same way. So the title of the message today is Persistently Pessimistic. Say that ten times real fast. Uh, most of us, we, we know what uh, persistency is, meaning you, you stay devoted to something. You're, you're, you're always involved. You're, you're, you're always pushing and striving for more. You're being persistent. Many of us are persistent about our jobs. We're persistent about our families. We're, we're persistent about being good mothers and fathers, good grandmothers, grandfathers. Uh, persistence, according to Webster's, is existing for a longer time than usual, continuously without change in the function. Um, going on no matter what is just putting it in layman's terms. And then the second part of this, pessimistic. Anybody know anybody that's pessimistic? Anybody know anybody that's negative? Always negative. Uh, negative Nancy or negative Nelson or whatever you want to call them, but there's they're some of those. Maybe, maybe you are the one that's negative and you just don't know it. Pessimistic is an inclination towards negative aspects or conditions and thoughts of the worst possible outcomes. Meaning, finding the worst in all things. Uh, that would be a glass slam empty type person, right? Pessimistic. But do you know people that are persistently pessimistic? I pray that there's not any, but I guarantee you that there is. There's somebody that's rode by and they've seen our sign for revival and they says, there's no need for reviving. There's no need for making a big deal about a homecoming service and having pastors come in and speak and try to get us revived. You know, revival means bringing life to something that's dead. Are we dead? Sometimes it seems that we might not be dead, but we're almost lifeless. Can I share a secret with you this morning? As a Christian, it's a real good sign of shallow faith when we are negative. Because we know how much God has done for us. We know how much He loves us. And many times we can be, as Christians, the chief of negativity. Sometimes we're the first ones to, when you walk up on somebody that you hadn't seen for a while, instead of talking about Christ, you turn to politics, you turn to weather, you turn to the things that are all negative, and it doesn't take long till your conversation is bad, 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 bad. Whatever happened to the time that you came up and you talked about your grandkids? You talked about your church? You talked about who got baptized last week? Or you talked about the healing that you've seen God render in your own life or somebody that you love? You see, it's, it's a choice of whether we go to the negative side or we go to the positive side. And that's the reason for the scriptures that I guess God has led me to this morning. So don't be dismayed. Many biblical characters were extremely negative as well. And you know, they just didn't feel comfortable with sticking their necks out. Sound familiar? Uh, or they just didn't uh, want to get involved. Or didn't want to butt in or, 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 or all those things. Well, you get the picture. Most folks want to remain in their comfortable spots, even if being in a different spot is really where God would have them. 
I didn't intend to share this, but I will real quick. So Friday morning, we have a Friday morning prayer breakfast, men's breakfast at the uh, Pier restaurant in Marshville at 630 on Friday mornings. And Friday morning, I left home early to try to get there about 620. So I'm going down Highway 205 about 615, 620 going to Marshville. And I just happened by the grace of God to look over to my right and down a ravine in the grass, I could see the top of a vehicle. All I could see was the top. And I'm thinking, I got to go. I got to be there, you know. But then I'm thinking, no, if I find out later that somebody was in there and I could have done something about it, then shame on me. So I turn around and go back, and I'm praying the whole time that there's nobody in there, that everything's fine, all that. So I run, park, and I run up the road, and I holler down in there, and nobody answers. And it's down in there pretty good. So I go back to my truck. I find It wasn't hard to find the way that they got down in there. And I begin to nervously walk up on the vehicle. The whole time I'm calling 911, I'm trying to get some help. And finally, as I got to the vehicle, I cried out again. And the guy answered. And he was okay. My point is, though, what if I'd have went on? Hadn't worried about it to come back later. They were dragging the vehicle out, all that. I wouldn't have known he was okay. I stayed with him until the law got there, the ambulance, all those things. He checked out fine. Had just a short word of prayer with him before I left. I don't know his last name. I don't know where he lives, but I know his first name is Harry. There was some reason that Harry and I were supposed to cross paths Friday morning at 620. God had intentions. My intentions might not have been God's, but they were because he turned me around. You see? Sometimes he's got to get our attention so that we will do what he intends for us. Real quickly this morning, we're going to take a look at the Old Testament story of the 12 scouts, the 12 spies chosen by Moses, sent off to the land of Canaan to explore that land, the promised land that God had promised them. All these scouts were, were very, probably young, revered soldiers, most likely. And they were from the 12 tribes of Judah. In Numbers uh, chapters 13 and 14, these are two pivotal chapters in the history of God's people. And these verses that we'll cover here in a moment will provide us with an illustration of what happens when we either obey God or we don't obey God. So let's look real quickly at Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. It said, The Lord now said to Moses, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the twelve ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out twelve men, all tribal leaders of Israel, from their camp into the wilderness of Paran. Now, let me just tell you, the wilderness is not what you think. It's not out in Alaska with six foot of snow. It's not in the jungles of Africa uh, with, with great nice plants and snakes and all those things. No, when they go in the, in the wilderness, they are in the desert, the dry desert. Look at some of these pictures. Look at the rock faces and the cliffs. They were traveling hard. Sun beating down on them. And he sent them out to figure out, is this land really as good as we think it is? And can we survive there? If you, you can go back and read it later, but it shows the ones that he sent, the 12. Shemar, Shaphat, Caleb, Igal, Joshua, Palti, Gadel, Gadi, Emil, Setur. Naba and Gael. He sent these men out to search out the land. And Moses gave them some instructions as he sent them there. He told them which direction to go, where to travel to. He told them you would find these things. And then he said this, see what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls? Are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or is it poor? 
Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back some samples of the crops that you see because it happened to be the harvest season. So they went up as they were instructed. And let's flip over to um, verses 25 and let's look there. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit that they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But, but, that's a big word, the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report, negativity. They spread it about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants. There, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that was their thought too. Now, let me stop there and say, when he says that was their thought too, they were living in the perception of what they thought the others thought of them. You ever lived in that? Well, guess what? We do it every day because we worry about what people think of us, how we look, how we dress, what we drive, our social status, how smart we are, how we talk. You see, our recept perception of ourself is received from what we feel like your perception is of me. That's not how God works, though. When God makes a promise, it's a promise for all eternity. But you see, they were scared. What happened? These were supposed to be young warriors, highly esteemed leaders of their respective armies. But when they were taken out of their comfort zones, they caved, or at least 10 of them did. They said, uh-oh, uh, there's some negative discussion. All the people got on board. Well, they, they got to be right. You know, these, these 10 of them giving us the same report. I don't know who the spokesman was, but they just went right along with it. That sounds familiar for us sometimes. I've told you for four and a half years, don't watch the news. It just gets you revved up for nothing. Watch the weather and the sports and turn the rest off. Or wait to the last 30 seconds and they'll tell you something good. But you see, sometimes we get bits and pieces. Not, not all news is bad. I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious, but seriously, we don't always get the whole story. And they begin to say, well, we can't do this. The stakes are too high. We, we can't risk it. The costs are too great. What if we fail? We'll be embarrassed. What if I witness to that person and they shoot me down? I'll be embarrassed. What about if I, if I stand up in the midst when everybody's going against what I know is right and I stand up to be different or I walk away how will they feel towards me? What if I'm in school and I'm caught reading a Bible when I'm not busy with schoolwork? What if somebody sees me pray for my lunch? You see, it's a decision that we have to make. Are we going to serve God or are we going to coward to the circumstances. 
And you see, we, we don't have time to cover the whole story, but the people here are telling God they would rather wander aimlessly in the vast desert wilderness than to take a chance. And it really wasn't a chance. God had already promised them that that land is yours. Take it. You see, when you compare what you lack to what others possess, then intimidation replaces your confidence. Let me say that again. When you compare what you lack to what others have, then there is an intimidating factor that takes away the confidence in yourself. That's why people are searching for the next best thing all the time, because they have no confidence in themselves. They're not sure of themselves and how they feel. And negativity spreads like wildfire. It spreads much quicker than the good news. Let's flip over to chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. It said, Then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt, or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? What are they saying? Return back to slavery? Then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless. Pray to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. The whole community began talking about stoning these two guys, putting them to death because they were against the others, but they were following the leadership of God. And then the Lord says to Moses, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to put them to death. Why in the world would they be challenging me? And Moses pleaded their case. Let's look at this map for just a moment. Stick that back up there. I went past it, Nick. Sorry. So here's a map of the wilderness. You see Egypt over there. The dotted blue line is their travel path. The time that the, all this is going on is number 12 up there, right above Kadesh Barnea. And this is where Moses challenged the 12 spies to go into the promised land. They went north and traveled into Canaan. You see those areas. And they begin to see how the other people lived. And they came back in the report and once the people decided that they were not going to follow God's command, then guess what happened? He sent them back into the wilderness, pan out again. Instead of going north into the promised land, they traveled in the wilderness for 40 years. Let's look at verse 20, 20 through 25. Then the Lord said, I will pardon them as you have requested. Moses stood up for his people, begged God not to put them to death. But as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will ever enter that land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. They will never even see the land I swore to give their ancestors. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. But my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others. 
He has remained loyal to me. I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of that land. And then he tells them to turn around and go back into the wilderness. Now, I don't know the exact number, but some Bible scholars say there was 3,000 that went on and tried to go into the promised land on their own. Even though God told them to turn around, even though Moses told them that it wasn't going to work, guess what? They lost their lives because they were not following God. They were following themselves. But what was to be Caleb and Joshua's reward for remaining faithful? Well, they would see the promised land. God made a promise that anyone older than 20 years of age would perish while they wandered in the wilderness for the next 40 years. One year for every day of the of their reconnaissance mission, the Israelite people wandered in the desert. The 10 other spies were struck down with plagues and they died. Moses interceded for them or they would even have died quicker. The Israelite people would be punished for their views of God and not taking Him at His word. Moses continued to be their leader, but he too didn't make it into the promised land. Joshua led them there. But fast forward 40 years after they traveled into the promised land, if you can stick that up there one more time, and look at the path that they went north, when they got up to the top of that path and they crossed over the sea, then Joshua took them there. But you see where Mount Nebo is. Moses was blessed with the opportunity to climb to the top of Mount Nebo and to see into the promised land before he died. He surely knew that it was a land flowing full of milk and honey and that God had promised it to them and he was going to provide. Real quickly in closing. Some of the reminders that Moses gave them are timeless to those people. And we should bear them as mine as well. There's four points to make as we close here. Our minds, souls, and spirits should be focused upon God. The number one thing is courage. How do you have courage? Well, you keep standing up for the battle for what's right. You see, we need to stand firm in our beliefs and our commitments. We need not to be afraid of our enemies and for those that mock us, even when they outnumber us. The second thing is hope. We should be careful to remember what God has done for us in the past. Has God not done great miracles for you as an individual? If He has, why do you think He's going to stop now? He's not. Remain faithful in your hope. Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 8 says these words, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you and He will neither fail you nor abandon you. And Moses called for Joshua and said, Be strong and courageous for you will lead the people to this new land that the Lord swore to our ancestors that he would give them, you will be the one who will divide it among them as grants of land, and the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. So have great hope. The number three thing is priority. Nothing should come before our love of God. Our God has promised that the only way to remain successful in life is to maintain a commitment to Him no matter what our circumstances. And the last thing is determination. Now, I guarantee you that some of you had a hard time making it to church this morning. Something happened. The devil put roadblocks in your way. He slowed you up. You thought you was going to be late. You're getting kids ready. All those things. But determination got you here. Determination will get you here tonight, Tomorrow night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, if you really want to come. Determination is the key 
to a lots of things. We must all maintain our commitment to obey God, to fear God, and to hold fast unto Him. When we think we need more motivation, guess what? All we have to do is look at a cross and think back to what God did for us through His Son, Jesus. This week, when you've been in the community and you've been inviting, that's really the only motivation that we need to invite others. This week, when you've been praying and you will continue praying, the great motivation we need is the motivation of what God did for us on the cross. Last verses. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Now, New Home, Peaceland, Popeton, New Salem, what does the Lord require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God. You live in a way that pleases Him, and you love Him, and you serve Him with all your heart and soul. And skip down to verse 20. You must fear the Lord your God and worship Him and cling to Him. Your oaths must be in His name alone. He alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise, the one who has done those, these mighty miracles that you have seen with your own eyes. And then he reminds them of something. He says, when your ancestors went down into Egypt, there were only 70 of them. But now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. Moses wrote that book of Deuteronomy while he was camping there around that Mount Nebo. And then he perished there. Maybe this week you've seen something like this. It's got a match on there with fire burning. It's inviting to our revival. You're wondering, can we really have revival? I hope you've been praying for it. I hope you've been praying for someone to show up here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. But you know, it's more apt to happen out there than it is in here. You see, because some people are just not going to come to church. They're just not. But you can live through an example that Jesus left, and you can show them there's something special about being a child of God. And then just maybe they'll be drawn closer to Him. The Bible says only God can do the drawing. Christ can do the drawing. And then it says, if I am lifted up, then all men will be drawn to me. You see, the negative aspects of life can pull you down, drag you down. It can even make you wonder about your self-worth and your worth of being Christian. But the Bible, the Bible's never wrong. It's always right and always on time. Will we have revival because we put up some signs, because we gave out some postcards? You know, we will not have revival until we realize our need for Christ. Every hour, every minute, every second of every day. Do you feel that? Are you living like you feel that? You know, maybe there's some things in your life that uh, you know aren't right. You may not have the power to change them, but the Spirit of Jesus Christ does. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead resides in you and I if we call upon Him to be our Savior. Have you asked Him into your heart? Are you living the way He would have you to live? I'm going to ask you to stand as Tim comes. We don't want to be late for our meal, but we don't want to quench the Spirit. The altar is open if you need to come and pray. If there's someone here that needs to rededicate their life or come to know Christ for the first time, then today is a day of salvation. Don't put it off to tonight or tomorrow.
you make that decision today. Let's pray. Father, we love you for who you are. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for this homecoming Sunday. We thank you for your message, for the obedience of Caleb and Joshua to remain faithful even when everyone else said it wouldn't work. Lord, they were greatly rewarded as they went into that promised land and all those youngsters that went with them. See, we don't think about it, Lord, but while they were people passing away, they were new folks being born, that they had not rebelled against you, and they traveled on and went into that promised land. Maybe they're the reason that we're here where we are today. The message carried over to the disciples. They brought it to us. Hopefully we can be disciples to others. Bringing your message and your gospel. Touching hearts and lives that way would not perish. And reside in hell after they pass away. Father, we love you for who you are. And I pray that your spirit is here alive and well with us this morning. And that you would touch our hearts during this invitation time. In Christ's name we pray.